Andrzej. Dear Mr. Tadziolu, Excellencies and distinguished guests, distinguished academic faculty, dear students, and uh, dear parents of the students that are, are here. I am truly delighted to be with you here tonight, this afternoon. And it is not only an honor, but uh, I would say a duty after having been elected by you with such a large majority. And uh, it is true, I was surprised to have been elected when I was not running for something. Maybe this is a way to be elected when, uh, in other races also. But today, in crossing the Aegean to come to meet you, one is always stunned, and I was stunned again today, by the beauty of our region. From the skies, looking at the sea, looking at the coast, looking at the islands, I always feel a deep sense of peace and calm. Yet so many battles have been fought. So many lives have been lost. So many invaders have come through that we can easily say, we can say to ourselves, we have more history to consume than we could ever possibly need. One of the oldest tales of humankind began here. A tale that was sung by many and that was handed down from generation to generation. And today still remains one of the most important legacies for literature, for history, and for philosophy. It is the Iliad. This is the story of Troy. It was a time when men went to war for the beauty of the eyes of a woman. Women beautiful. I feel they must be smiling at us, maybe even laughing at us. They have always known that the species called humans are only a small part of a much larger world. They have always known how fleeting our lives may be. But now as we look at ourselves from the sky, or even the space, as we can communicate with each other in a few milliseconds over the internet, or I can come and visit in one hour to Istanbul, now maybe we can also put our lives into a new perspective. We can see the broader picture of the world. We can sift out what is meaningful and what is not. But I think that is what Homer was trying to do when he wrote the Iliad. He was trying to give meaning to events. This is and this will be the longest battle that human beings have ever fought. One of the most noble pursuits of the humankind. The search for knowledge, for understanding. And it is here in such institutes of learning that we try to give meaning to our lives and to the world around us. And this is my first message to you. You have just finished a most important pursuit, the pursuit of knowledge, the pursuit of understanding, so that you can better develop your capacities and be creative in meeting the challenges in your life. I congratulate you, all of you personally and your families. It is one of the most important moments of your life. But the pursuit does not end here. Maybe this is why Homer wrote another masterpiece. He wrote the Odyssey, the story of Ulysses or Odysseus, the warrior who after leaving Troy must return home to Ithaca. In this story becomes a search, a search to reach his destiny. And in many ways, this is what our lives are all about, a search to reach our Ithaca. Or maybe a continual search for never-ending Ithacas, as so many young people love to do on the Greek islands, 
hopping from one island to another, each time discovering something new, something beautifully strange, something mag magical, new challenges at every port they arrive at, having been put in jail for their political beliefs. When I then went to four different high schools and three different universities from Sweden to Canada to the United States to Europe, I had begun my odyssey. I also was in search of my Ithaca. It never, not once, did it cross my mind that one day I would be standing here in front of you, a Greek, speaking to the graduate class of Sabanji University in Turkey. You also today, after getting your when you feel insecure, facing a new challenge, don't panic. Don't let your irrational take over. Define what is rational and what is irrational. What is worthwhile and what is not. And that way, for Europe, for Turkey, for Greece, do we have common destinations? Can we create them? Do we want to? Comparison with Sabanji University. What is a university? It's buildings, yes. And congratulations. It is, in fact, basic values and methods. As a matter of fact, even as sciences continue to develop and change in new areas, new presidency of the European Union, in 2003, we asked ourselves, what is Europe? Encapsulate and summarize what Europe was. A Europe that was enlarging, expanding, a Europe that was becoming ever more diverse. And we asked ourselves, is Europe a group of different peoples? Yes, Europe is also a group of different peoples. Is uh, Europe a region with common history? Possibly, if you interpret history in that way. The European Union. So we had the Greeks. We called our presidency our Europe. And underneath Europe. So as we look at Europe, a community of ours. After wars, after four and fifty five years, more rational, more humane, more secure, more free. Citizens fear that Brussels is getting further and further away as it is becoming too bureaucratic, too undemocratic as we enlarge. Extremists fear that we may lose our cultural, cultural heritage and identity as we enlarge as a European Union. Industry fears that Europe is changing too slowly, too slowly to deal with the new challenges such as India and China. Workers fear that changes are coming too fast. There are three questions we must deal with as leaders. The first question is, as leaders, do we cultivate this fear? Do we cultivate this insecurity? 
basically says, we leaders, I have the solution. I am the leader. There is fear out there. Vote for me. Difficult decisions, difficult routes, if you like, to make some important and painful changes. But we can say there are three issues I would like to address. One is democracy. In the European Union, I have and what I always said, and many others said, is many citizens of Europe feel too far we have a European referendum, not national referendums, but one European wide referendum, so that people really feel they can have a European voice. But what I basically was saying is we need to address the democratic deficit of nation, infrastructure, education. With 1%, some people feel that they can squeeze Europe into this budget. With 1%, I feel we are squeezing our citizens back into their national corners, and that will create problems. A third big issue which Tony Blair has raised is the one of agriculture, which I also mentioned earlier. Organic, linked up with tourism, with health tourism, with cultural tourism, with regional development has to do with whether Europe is the solution or whether Europe is the problem. This is a third leadership question. And to that my answer is that Europe is the solution. As a matter of fact, in a globalizing world, Europe is the answer. The stronger, the more diversified we become, the more I propose that we should think of a new Europe as a creative Europe. A Europe with so many different countries, we should make this diversity not, as see, as, not see it as a weakness, but see it as a strength. Well, Europe could become a forerunner of being a very creative society with the best of universities, the best of research. So let us think what a creative Europe would mean. First of all, it would mean to use our diversity as an asset. to all these questions is, of course, no. The real question should be, does the European Union have the capacity to deal with a globalizing society and a globalizing economy? So when we talk of enlargement, why don't we ask ourselves these questions? Will an enlarged Europe be more competitive? Yes. Will an enlarged Europe be better able to protect workers? Yes. Will an enlarged Europe attract more investment? Yes. Will an enlarged Europe create a more cohesive and sustainable economy? Certainly. Will an enlarged Europe contribute to democracy and stability in a wider region? Yes, again. Will an enlarged Europe have a stronger voice in international affairs? Again, yes. Will an enlarged Europe play a more assertive role in global issues such as climate change, poverty, GMOs, cultural dialogue, and cultural partnership? The answer to all these questions is yes. An enlarged Europe will have positive advantages in dealing with all these issues. It will be positive for all Europeans. But let's focus a little bit on our neighborhood. Southeastern Europe, still struggling to shake off the effects of violent and turbulent history, divisions. Ensuring the European Union's stabilizing influence in the Western Balkans, as difficult talks on Kosovo and its future status begin, this is vital to our security. If Europe were to say no to enlargement, to the enlargement strategy, the consequences for Southeastern South Europe would be disastrous. Enlargement is and will be an investment for our regional stability. The fact that the EU enlargement has been a real success story we can see in Central and Eastern Europe. 
it has been the most important incentive for growth, democracy, and stability. I'll give you an example. When Estonia and Hungary started attracting a lot of foreign investment in the 1990s, journalists stopped referring to these two countries as weak economies with institutional difficulties. And they began writing about the Central European Tigers. And that made a big difference in their accession prospects. Instead of being viewed as potentially unstable countries, they needed the EU to remain stable. Central and Eastern Europeans could argue that they have actually contributed to the dynamism of the European Union. And this is the role Turkey could play in the coming years. And I am convinced that Turkey needs Europe, but Europe also needs Turkey. Welcoming Turkey into our union will send a positive message around the world. Certainly a message in a, a very critical time that a country whose majority is Muslim can become a model democratic European country, easing tensions between Christianity and Islam, which is very important for Europe, very important for Europe which has a very vibrant Muslim community. Turkey's integration into Europe can counter and be a counterweight to fundamentalism, which often brings extreme acts. And this kind of a model can be a very important model for the world. I just came from a visit from the Ecumenical Patriarch, and I believe that this European model, with its small Greek minority, who live here in Istanbul as Turkish citizens, they pose no threat to Turkey. In fact, the Patriarch is one of the most avid supporters of Turkey's European prospects. I know wherever he goes, he is a strong supporter for Turkey's accession. So I believe that it's a very important step in Turkey's European direction would be for Turkey to recognize the Ecumenical Patriarchate, we open the Theological School of Halki and respect their rights. Can you imagine the symbolism of a Muslim country that embraces the Mecca of Orthodox Christianity? And the real candidacy of the unstable countries that needed the EU to remain stable, Central and Eastern Europeans could argue that they have actually contributed to the dynamism of the European Union. And this is the role Turkey could play in the coming years. And I am convinced that Turkey needs Europe, but Europe also needs Turkey. Welcoming Turkey into our union will send a positive message around the world. Certainly a message in a very critical time that a country whose majority is Muslim can become a model democratic European country easing tensions between Christianity and Islam, which is very important for Europe, very important for Europe which has a very vibrant Muslim community. Turkey's integration into Europe can counter and be a counterweight to fundamentalism, which often brings extreme acts. And this kind of a model can be a very important model for the world. I just came from a visit from the Ecumenical Patriarch, and I believe that this European model, with its small Greek minority who live here in Istanbul as Turkish citizens, they pose no threat to Turkey. In fact, the Patriarch is one of the most avid supporters of Turkey's European prospects. I know wherever he goes, he is a strong supporter for Turkey's accession. So I believe that it's a very important step in Turkey's European direction would be for Turkey to recognize the Ecumenical Patriarchate, reopen the Theological School of Halki and respect their rights. Can you imagine the symbolism of a Muslim country that embraces the Mecca of Orthodox Christianity? And the real candidacy means 
that Turkey can hope to become a full member of the European Union with all the rights and responsibilities this brings, as long as it meets all the conditions for membership. And this position remains unchanged. But why is Greece such a staunch supporter for Turkey's membership? Why do we support Southeastern Europe's entry into the European Union? I have felt, and we in Greece believe that our long-lasting problems can be solved. In a new framework, one where we will respect borders, but where borders will become less relevant, I would say almost irrelevant in our daily lives, as we, it's almost like getting on a bus when you go from Athens to Munich. No passports, no borders. We are all, it will be a very different framework where we all have the same values and principles. Where all our citizens of the same family will be able to live together, Greek Cypriots, Turkish Cypriots, Greeks and Turks, Serbs, Croats, Albanians. Where we solve our problems peacefully, understand each other and respect each other. And where we look at our common interest in the region and in Europe rather than our differences. All this creates new potential for solutions. Solutions which are not zero-sum solutions, but win-win solutions for all. This is where we felt, and I felt, we could transform Cyprus from a problem to make it a model, a model of a multicultural Europe, where Muslims and Christians, Greeks and Turks can decide so that all Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots have the full benefits of EU membership. I believe one of the main reasons why the Greek Cypriots voted no was again the issue of fear and security. And here, of course, when you have 30,000 Turkish troops on the island, the Green Line, a prosperous Greek Cypriot, Greek, Cypriot, Turkey, the Greek Cypriot community, which fears that it may lose this prosperity, it means that in exploring, even exploiting petroleum, if there is some under the seabed, but certainly work on issues such as environment in the Aegean, tourism and culture, much more than we have done up to today. So I believe Turkey realizes that Greece can be a very strong ally on the road to its European future. And this we have tried over the years, and with Ismail Chen we worked very closely in even giving the technical expertise to the Turkish side, where Greeks and Turks for the first time worked together to help in this European prospect. The compass, they become the map. And on that road to Ithaca, you will meet many unexpected events, but you know your basic direction. And to this end, the Commission will soon launch an open debate in civil society in Turkey and in Europe and other countries such as Croatia to give a stronger voice to students, to journalists, to trade unions, to activists. I would say use that voice so that you communicate your message to fellow Europeans in other countries and communicate this positive message. And when it comes to get your degree, when it comes time to get your degree, it would be a different Europe as it will be a very different Turkey. And Europe will have learned from you. Thank you to Greece and thank you very much. I remember the, the Greek newspaper, Tanea, running a title saying, we are all Turks. And then Kuriet answering, thank you, friend. So this was a solidarity that
As we are together on this boat to uh, our Ithaca of peace, I have a small gift for Mrs. Sabanji uh, to uh, symbolize this road to peace. Thank you. 